Croatia, a country of 4.2 million people, blessed by Adriatic Sun, hit by the Balkan splits and wars of the 1990s, is the EU's 28th member. This is a wonderful day for Europe. Or is it? Because elsewhere in Europe, there's a very different story playing out. People are not celebrating, but are clearly unhappy about certain aspects of the European Union. People, if they feel that it's not for them, it's not in their favor, it's just in favor of the big interests, in favor of the big companies, in favor of the, of the governments, but not in favor of them, because they only see bad things coming from the European Union. Uh, austerity policies are devastating uh, social, the social protection in Spain. It is uh, bringing despair, uh, inducing a certain deterioration into our democracy. Behind me here, they're constructing the new building for the President of the Council. It's known in Brussels as the Egg. The question is, what sort of Europe will they hatch? Here at this meeting of the European Greens, it's quite remarkable the number of people who say they want more Europe. But this contrasts with the rising tide of Euroscepticism that we see throughout Europe. More Europe or less Europe? I also have to say more Europe. More Europe, more Europe. We need more Europe. I think we need more Europe. More and less. We would like to have more Europe. More Europe. Definitely more Europe, but... Better functioning Europe. More Europe. Better Europe. More Europe, definitely. We want a different kind of Europe. More Europe, definitely. More Europe. Better Europe. I'm here in Trinity College in Dublin asking young people how they view the European Union. No, it's, 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 just, it's outdated. It was useful about 50 years ago, but now it's, just, it's too big as well. The thing is, like a European identity, one would never identify oneself as European. It's like countries such as Ireland, anything on the peripheral area, like south of Italy, like you don't get the same benefits. The bigger and bigger you get, the more and more issues you introduce and the more and more diluted whatever solution is proposed. In this modern age, Multinational corporations are increasingly powerful. The European Union could be a really interesting counterbalance to that if it was done properly and if it was really coming from the people. But at the moment it's not. It's coming from the centre out, which is the wrong way to go. There are varying views about Europe, and people in many countries have taken to the streets in opposition to what they believe to be EU policies being imposed on them. People know that they want jobs, they want democracy, they want a future. European people say, I don't want Europe if Europe means uh, less solidarity. And given the neoliberal policy which has been implementing at the European level for a couple of the last years under the leadership of uh, Jose Barroso, it's not enough uh, to, uh, to tell people that we would like to have more Europe and to convince them to support it. European um, rules have created a situation very much in favour of multinational companies, of privatisation, of outsourcing of government services. People need to understand some sense that, that there is a plan particularly for unemployment. You can't say to European people that this project is working when your son and daughter doesn't seem to have a future. The fact that the European Union does not do what you want it to do does not mean that you have to scrap it all. Europe is more and more being blamed on what's going on and this of course is, is not helping those of us who think that, that Europe is a good idea and that we need more Europe. Peter Sutherland is not only a former EU commissioner of the Christian Democrat tradition, he's also a businessman who has headed up some of the major global corporations. Austerity, as you describe it, is uh, undermining people's confidence in their own state and perhaps also in, in Europe. Austerity is working, but it was not used in the right way. <laughs> now it's not working. They know in Greece, they know in Spain, they know in Portugal, they know in Ireland that we cannot continue to live beyond our means. It's a ridiculous theory to shrink into growth. There's a concern now in the European Union that many of our citizens have lost confidence in the EU project. Many of them have even forgotten that the EU was actually formed so that we would never again allow the destruction caused by the Second World War. The Spanish public opinion 
uh, used to be the most among the most pro-European because it's a consequence of Spain coming out of 40 years of, of fascist dictatorship. And when Spain joined Europe in, in 1986, it was Europe was seen as, uh, as freedom, as civil rights, uh, environment, democracy. Europe is the only possible utopia, but we need a different Europe. But if Europe is the only possible utopia, then how are we to reconcile that with national interests which have become stronger and more vocal on account of the economic crisis? At the core of the problem is we retreated in a fearful time back to nationalism. Fearful of cooperation, fearful of shared sovereignty, fearful of taking collective action. So to bail out the banks, Europe immediately got together and we are now giving 60 million euros to Greece and this is bringing out nationalistic egoisms. I believe that free movement of people is part and parcel of the basic contract of the European Union itself. A country like mine, Malta, is faced with the boat people and there is not one European policy on this. The issue of immigration has become a major problem within the European Union and there appears to be no immediate solution, despite the fact that the free movement of people is part and parcel of globalisation. We're living in a globalised world with globalised issues whether it's climate change or migration or trade or development, all of them are part of an interdependent world. And Europe can only play a full role in this if we are more integrated. What we can and must do is delivering the banking union. It is the first and most urgent phase on the way to deepen our economic and monetary union I do favour banking union, the European Parliament voted in favour of banking union already um, in 2010. We should look towards the future. I do uh, favour fiscal union, even though that can only be a step-by-step -step approach. I believe a political union. And I do support political union, even though I am not supportive of a uh, federalist vision. If Europe is in crisis, is there not a danger that we go too far and step over the edge? We can get this acceptance for banking union, fiscal union, political union only if uh, Europe delivers a better uh, in the field of uh, social justice. Maybe we should uh, uh, be careful about having more Europe, but in the right fields. Security, foreign policy, migration, and not only, and necessarily, fiscal union. The problem is not Europe. The problem we are facing is how Europe is managed. Especially uh, in the last decade, since we have seen an expansion of right-wing governments uh, in, in most of the European countries. If we want to rebalance Europe and integrate Europe, we need to do it on the social dimensions as well. And we need to be as serious about having um, a, a social Europe as we've been about having a monetary and an economic Europe. It's very clear now that creating the euro without a fiscal union was a major mistake. Everything hinges on the survival of the euro. If the euro goes, so too does the European Union. The most tangible symbol of the European Union is this, a euro banknote. What do you see on it? You don't see like inspiring Europeans like Socrates or Leonardo da Vinci or Mozart. What they've actually given us is a window that you can't see through and a bridge that goes from nowhere to nowhere. Is there any more potent symbol of the European Union bureaucracy than that? Given the current crisis, is it possible for the Euro to survive? I think it's probable that the Euro will survive because it is, as Mrs Merkel has said, an existential issue for the European Union itself. We have uh, the need uh, for a better construction behind uh, the Euro, the common currency. Uh, with requirements for the banking union, with requirements for common taxation. If we get a fiscal union, we need a political union. Banking union, fiscal union, political union, they all raise for us the basic principal concerns about subsidiarity and decisions not being made at a remote centre, but being made close to the people affected. In Britain, the government has even promised a referendum on membership of the European Union. It's by far and away the biggest crisis that the European Union has ever faced. 
years ago, uh, Mrs Thatcher recognised the truth behind the European project. She saw that it was about taking away democracy from nation states and handing that power to largely unaccountable people. No, no, no. I think there are questions about the, the future of the European Union and its survival. I don't think that the UK will be the decider on that. But, of course, what the UK, what's happening in the UK at the moment is having an impact on quite a number of places and people are trying to work out, well, what do we think the European Union is for? Of course it's possible that people continue to reject the European Union. Would we tell the Polish, if they voted no, get lost? If you vote in a certain way, your vote is not only affecting you. Would we tell the Irish, get lost? But you can decide and negotiate how you are out. That's not how we're building the European Union. We should support the idea of having a referendum in the UK. And then, of course, we have to go there and, uh, and negotiate and um, um, campaign for them to stay in. But if they want to go out, ciao! The worst thing that we can do, I think, is go along with Cameron's idea of somehow we go back to a single market, that we ditch social Europe, that the environmental side, well, we'll find a way of doing that. But, you know, the European Union can survive without the UK. But if we're to convince people to stay in the European Union, how do we change the Union from a faceless bureaucratic institution to something that people can believe in? People like change. They do. They like, to, you know, politicians are always promising us change, real change, more change, change you can believe in. We need more democracy in the European process and in the European institutions stronger European Parliament directly elected by the people. I'm in favour of power to the Parliament in principle. Uh, I think we've probably for the moment gone as far as we can go because the Parliament has not yet in the minds of the citizens established its own legitimacy. Europe now is far away from its citizens so we need instruments where citizens with a lot of ideas and motivations can bring that to the European Parliament. And all politicians uh, working in the European Union uh, must have a clear focus on how to make, uh, make Europe more visible to people in their everyday lives. There are many questions about the role of the European Commission. Do we really need 28 commissioners? And how should we choose those commissioners? I would change how the Commission is elected. When lawmaking starts in the Commission, it comes to the Parliament, and then you can only finish a law if the Council wants and when the Council wants, which sometimes means forever. I think we could one day get to the reduction of Commissioners, but not in the present state. We can do that when all of us, Maltese, Irish, Italian, French, etc., feel that we belong to Europe and that we don't identify anymore a commissioner with our country. But the Parliament should be able to oust a commissioner if he is not up to the job. And all of this will mean changes to how Europe actually works. Institutional changes. Changes to the European Parliament, for example. And this might be difficult to achieve. We should have a process because for the moment, uh, before each treaty, you have this, you have this conference and convention, you, yeah. yeah, this convention, but you don't have really like citizens participating. I think it is very unlikely that we will have a convention in the foreseeable future. There was great hope for the last convention which produced the European Constitution, but this unfortunately was rejected by a number of countries. Uh, as we talk about the convention, we have to do something which was really different than the one that happened in 2003. We have to get uh, political parties, we have to get uh, civil society, but we don't have to get governments inside there. What are the issues and new ideas that a convention can discuss and debate? I would change how the commission is elected. And uh, Europe has to change in three in three direction one is more transparency then really urgent is to make sure that the reform of the european union are not subject to unanimity vote and uh, for example people should know before the elections whom they actually vote for uh, when they when we talk about the the commission and the council um, first of all i would put a deadline to lawmaking in the european union this seems very minor but most of the people don't qualified majority voting on taxation on social policies, on foreign affairs. Mm -hmm. Well, I think what we need to do is see, give the Parliament much more power um, over decision-making. Uh, more presidential model with a, perhaps one day 
a president elected directly by the people of, of Europe. The European Parliament, the social partners, they have a right to uh, to talk to the Commission, they have the right to propose to the Commission, they have a right to... It's a change in the mind of people and in the mind of the governments. And then they shall give up a little bit of their sovereignty. Uh, we shall remember that the European Union was not, totally, it was not only a peace project, but first of all it was also a project which promised people to be free from fear and to be free from want. But did we not have a previous convention and wasn't the constitutional treaty rejected by the people? And isn't the main issue not constitutional changes, but jobs? Isn't the people's Europe a Europe where you can find work and have a decent standard of living? So what solutions do the Greens have to these problems? La réalité dans le monde, c'est que l'Europe n'est pas à la hauteur de la crise économique, de la crise, de la crise écologique et de la crise et de la crise financière. Il y en a assez, il y en a assez. Et ceux qui ne supportent pas d'être pris à contre-pied devant le dire pour l'émission. Well, what do we think the European Union is for? And I think for Greens, it's very clear that it's about still the big environmental issues, the global issues where we have to work together, issues about human rights, equality, democracy. And of course we know that uh, this climate policy, climate and energy policy should be implemented, but the problem is how we do it uh, in Poland, where the Polish economy is still based uh, on the coal, and this is a big challenge. When you look at how we would solve the energy equation of Europe, basically the energy needs are at what we call the core of Europe, but actually the more promising areas for energy production, renewable energy production, are, guess where, at the periphery. The uh, energy vendor, so the new uh, energy model for Europe, is uh, one of the fundaments uh, of the Green New Deal. Do it not as it was done in the 30s with, with you know, heavy uh, uh, heat industry, but do it with a green investment plan uh, for fighting climate change and uh, for new jobs in, the, in these countries. The Green New Deal policies have, to some degree, been implemented in some of the European countries, like in Germany, with a, a strong investment in renewable energies, real jobs in the real economy. There are many areas of policy where the Greens have been active and successful, but it's very clear that even further engagement with the European project is now required if we're to influence the type of Europe that Brussels is now hatching. If there had not been this Europe which we have, which with all its deficiencies and with all its defects, what would be the situation be like today? As I said myself, it's a little bit of a fairy tale. We also have to have these cultural uh, revolutions. People trust more in European institutions than in the Hungarian institutions. Europe is uh, a part of the, of the solution. There, there are pretty few alternatives to more Europe. There is no way back. We can help to build this new People's Europe by engaging with civil society, respecting different opinions and encouraging real debate. So let that debate begin. <laughs>